sort of four versions of it, and then we'll summarize. Um, I always want to start these um, talks with sort of a backdrop against what we need to be thinking about when we're when we're talking about uh, delivery of health care. And so this is the IOM six dimensions of, of quality that we want to deliver safe care. We want to deliver effective care that's based on um, scientific knowledge. We want patient centered care. We want timely care. And now we start getting into some of the telemedicine benefits potentially. Uh, efficient care. And this is the one, the, the final one, equitable care, is what a lot of people point to in telemedicine to say this is sort of justification of technology-enabled models of care, particularly um, care that there's no variation in care based on uh, ge geographic location um, or socioeconomic status. And telemedicine has played a role in overcoming some of those. So one of the things that's happened is that as the science of medicine has exponentially increased, it actually creates even greater disparities because some people have access to that and some people don't, and, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it creates uh, disparities. And the, the theme here is, is that advances in telecommunication and information technology can help redistribute healthcare knowledge and expertise and potentially um, reduce costs. The idea is that when appropriate that you move knowledge rather than move people. Um, if you can move knowledge to where the need is, you potentially can benefit people, particularly those with the greatest barriers to care, geographic barriers or socioeconomic barriers. I also want to, to whenever we do anything, to make sure that we're we're, we're doing something that's ethical, so I just want to put these up of, of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and, and, ju and, and justice. And again, people in the telemedicine community always point to uh, treating people equal, equal, equally and, and equitably. Um, so here we go, a definition. So the American Telemedicine Association basically says telemedicine is exchanging um, knowledge or information from one site to another using communication technology. A closely associated term is telehealth, and telehealth tends to be an umbrella term that includes telemedicine, but it also includes things like distance education and monitoring and, and things like that. The history of this it goes back a long ways. There was an article published in The Lancet in 1879 that talked about the use of the telephone to reduce unnecessary physician visits. There's a great case study um, where a, a physician uh, was called by a mother who had a sick child. He wanted to listen to the child's breathing. He said, that's croup, you know, and told the mother what to do and those kinds of things. Enthoven, who's the pioneer of the ECG, um, talked about remote interpretations of ECG, a telehealth example. Um, they were on ships, they used um, ship-to-shore radio for the infirmaries to talk to physicians on the shore in the 20s. And this was the cover of Science and Invention magazine in 1925. And they said in this article that in 50 years, this is the way medicine would be practiced. Now, it didn't quite get there in 1975, but, and think about this, this was before the television was, was invented. So they were already anticipating this kind of, of care. Where we sort of move into the modern era was in the late 50s and early 60s when closed circuit television was used. And this was used um, from uh, the, the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute to Norfolk State Hospital in, um, uh, that was 112 miles away where psychiatrists were con consulting um, to the state hospital. And the monitoring, which I'm gonna talk about monitoring towards the end of this talk, really got going um, in, in earnest with the NASA program with um, astronauts' physiologic um, uh, functions being measured. And then they advanced that further with something called STARPAC, which stands for the Space Technology Applied to Rural Papago Advanced Healthcare. They <coughs> did some studies with the Papago Indians, seeing if they could monitor vital signs using a satellite link. Um, and this, you know, is, Today, they're, they're monitoring people all the time on the, on the uh, space station and other things. So I'm going to talk about this in four settings. I'm going to talk about outpatient ambulatory care. I'm going to talk about hospital care, including emergency medicine. I'm going to talk about chronic disease management in the home and in the community. 
And then I'm going to talk about the last thing, which is direct-to-consumer care, meaning that it's care that the, the patient initiates online, swiping their credit card and, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. And we'll talk about that because there's some ethical issues with that. Um, clinical uh, care in the ambulatory setting, we use these high-definition uh, screens. Um, there's all kinds of these carts out there that can be in the remote, the rural clinic. Um, there's plenty of people that will sell you these kinds of things, and that's what, that's what the patient would see in an exam room in a rural clinic if they were getting a consult from a psychiatrist or a neurologist or something. We have a number of medical peripherals that are getting more and more sophisticated all the time. That little camera is a 50-zoom camera, but you have stethoscopes and otoscopes, etc. Now, the threshold for getting into this and the costs are getting l less and less. This is an, a, an iPad in there. All the, there's an ultrasound in there. There's an otoscope. There's a stethoscope, et cetera. And again, we start to get into some things like how high a quality stuff do we need to do a consult and whether it is that an issue. Um, another form of outpatient telemedicine is um, what we call asynchronous or store and forward telemedicine. And that means that it's not a live interactive video. It's taking images and sending them to a specialist to interpret. And this is um, mm -hmm. retinal screening for diabetics. Um, diabetics need to have their, you know, their retinas looked at once a year. And, you know, there's a, a lot of people that don't do that. But this is a non midriatic camera. So it means that they don't dilate your eyes. They take a picture of your retina. They send it to retinal specialists. Those retinal specialists can look at it at their leisure and say, I reviewed these 100 and these five people I need to actually drive in to see because I need to treat. They've had, there's actually been some good studies on Indian reservations and other places where there's high rates of diabetes, and it increases the rate of screening. Now, is this as good as a dilated retinal exam where you're in an uh, office where they dilate it? So what if it's almost as good, but a lot more people get it? Is, this, is that a good thing or not? And so those are the kinds of things that we'll talk about. This is another very famous asynchronous use of, uh, that was funded by the federal government. Northern Alaskans, Nor Northern Alaskan natives, have high rates of middle ear disease. So they train community health workers to do otoscopy, look at the, look in the ear. Um, to do tympanometry, see how well the eardrum moves, and audiometry, see how well people hear. And then they would, they would send these down to ENT docs at Anchorage and Fairbanks, and they would make determinations of who needed to come down for surgery. But you could also follow up with, is that ear tube in the right place? Did it fall out um, after the person's return? Again, we're getting more and more um, technology that's cheaper and cheaper. This is CellScope. You can buy this. This was developed at UC Berkeley. I work with a team at UC Berkeley on research, but this was developed with a team at UC Berkeley. You snap it onto your iPhone. You can put it in somebody's ear. You can take a picture, and I can send it with a secure text. I can send it to an ENT and say, you put this tube in two weeks ago. This ear still looks red to me. Does this person need to come and see? you or should I put them on antibiotics? So again, a lower threshold to get people in. Um, this is um, dermatology, which is a very, very common form of asynchronous telemedicine, where we take a picture, we send it to a dermatologist. This is from the California Healthcare Foundation. Basically, this child, um, the, the, uh, the child was on Medicaid, uh, Medi-Cal in our state, um, uh, the nearest time a community dermatologist could see this child was five months, direct term, which was developed by some dermatologists at Stanford. Um, they um, saw this child in, in one day, diagnosed a spitzoid melanoma, all taken care of in less than eight weeks. So timely care. You remember our dimensions of quality. Um, so again, it, it, is, uh, it can be valuable. So does this work? So there's... Um, I put these. I put only three of these up, but but Rashid Bashur um, is a researcher at uh, University of Michigan, and he took a, took it on to go through almost every specialty and say, does telemedicine work in this specialty? And researched all the literature, 
and just for full disclosure, I'm on several of his papers. There's about uh, 20 of us from multiple universities that did these reviews. And basically, most specialties work quite well. And the kinds of literature that, we're, that we reviewed are things like patient <coughs> satisfaction. Again, patient satisfaction is universally uh, positive, um, almost. There's hard to find a study where their patients aren't satisfied. Outcomes are good, but going back almost 20 years, there have been really good studies in things like dermatology. Witted at Duke did some very sophisticated crossover studies and other things uh, to show that they could do dermatology well. Another area that's really well studied is in mental health, and it does work well for the kinds of patients that are appropriate for that. One of the keys to this, though, is using guidelines. You know, what kind of conditions should be seen and what shouldn't be seen over telemedicine? What kinds of uh, tests are needed? What equipment is needed? Um, you, know, you know, what are the re requirements for a presenter? Because some types of telemedicine <laughs> require a physician presenter because you need someone to do parts of the physical exam for the consultant. So again, guidelines are key. I debated putting e-consult in, but <coughs> it is becoming so popular that I thought it was important to put in. So this is sending the contents of an electronic health record on a patient to a consultant and saying, is there something else I should be doing to treat this diabetic? This is what I've done, and please review their record, and they have all their labs, et cetera. There's been, this is a recent study, um, where they looked at a number of, of sort of a, a, across the literature and found that primary care physicians are pretty satisfied. In the VA study, they're very satisfied, but they found specialists, only about 53% were satisfied with this. 26%, in fact, were dissatisfied with this. The primary care physicians said it allowed them to manage patients that they otherwise would have referred. So we're more efficiently using medical resources, one of the things we're trying to do. Specialists agreed that they got more appropriate clinic visits. They, they quit getting inappropriate visits. They got more um, necessary follow-ups. Um, the studies on whether or not for a population in a health system that's using this are mixed. Some show that it does improve the quality of care. Some don't show that. But one of the things that's important, and I'm gonna reference this later, specialists have this added to their workload Reviewing uh, a, uh, somebody's record versus seeing a patient is inherently less satisfying is one of the things that they've, they've cited. So here are some challenges and opportunities. So one of the challenges is that we're limited to sight and sound. We need a surrogate to do parts of the examination. That's particularly true in things like neurology. Um, so, and if you're you know, trying to examine somebody's abdomen to see if there's a mass there. Do you feel a mass? I think I do, but maybe not. So adding things like ultrasound can really help with this. Image quality, is the image quality good enough for the specialist? Um, and all the, although the evidence base is, is actually quite strong in a number of areas, there's areas that still need to be uh, developed. I would say that standards really can eliminate a number of personal decisions. Is this an appropriate patient to see or not? It's good to have standards. And then reimbursement models need to continue to evolve to appropriate align incentives so that the patients that need this the most um, get it. So I'm just going to throw at the end of each one of these some ethical things up just to think about. These are, you know, just thoughts that I had. First of all, I always ask people when they're talking about a telemedicine application, is this a supplement or is this a substitute? So are you adding to the standard of care or are you substituting this for the standard of care? And if you're substituting it, there's a higher threshold that you have to reach to show that it's, it's good. Informed consent. A lot of states, including California, California just changed its, its law on informed consent um, to you have to document that you, you got informed consent but we used to have to have one in writing where patients needed to sign that. But the idea is patients should have a choice and they should also um, be told what the limitations are. What about if the patient says, I really don't want to drive two hours, can I just see the doctor over telemedicine? It's convenience versus necessity. 
when is almost as good adequate and, and ethical. Um, but what if you're providing more timely access, the kid with the melanoma? <coughs> when should cost be considered? So one of the areas is prison medicine. So we used to have gigantic, great contracts from the California Department of Corrections until they decided, we're paying these guys way too much. They developed their own gigantic telemedicine program. The reason they wanted telemedicine is because the custody costs are more than the medical costs. So if you're taking somebody out of one of our high-level prisons, mm. they have to have a chase car, they have to have multiple deputies, etc. cetera. Mm. But is that, what if it's not as good? Is that ethical to say, you're a risk to society? But in some Medicaid programs, they pay for the transportation if somebody needs to see a, a specialist. So what if they say, well, please use telemedicine rather than having the patient come down. So this gets back to the e-consult thing. We, it may it more efficiently use specialists, but what if, it, if specialists don't like it? I don't want to sit in a room and not see real people. I don't want to, you know, it, you know, what should we do there? And the other one is, should diagnostic consultation be available if treatment is available? We, um, through a, a HRSA grant, trained the U.S. protectorates uh, people down in uh, Guam and Ponape, American Samoa, those places. And as we were training that group, they were saying, this is great, but every time we get a consult, and they use, typically use Hawaii for their consults, they say, they tell us to use four or five different drugs that we don't have. So it doesn't do us any good to have that if, if, we, don't, if, we, if we can't treat it. Switching to the next area, I'm moving to um, emergency medicine. Emergency medicine is uh, becoming more common. Um, this is a study that was just published that, that shows that transfer times, when you have to transfer somebody out of a rural emergency room, it happens quicker if you have telemedicine in that emergency room. And it's, if you think about it, it's because you've already connected with an accepting physician at a hospital. But again, there is that benefit. But where this is really booming and getting bigger and bigger is in telestroke. So in stroke care, when people have ischemic strokes, they, there is a medication, TPA, that, that, that um, can be used. Um, the majority of people in this country who have that don't get it. Um, and so and a lot of times they come into hospitals without stroke neurologists. So, the American Heart, American Stroke Association says if you don't have a stroke neurologist immediately available in the window that you can give TPA, and it's been expanded a little bit from three hours to four hours to maybe six hours you can give it, but there is a time window that you can give that. Um, they, American Heart, American Stroke Association says you should have telemedicine in your emergency room. The way this works, you're in a rural hospital, somebody comes in with neuro, a neurologic deficit, you contact a stroke neurologist online. That stroke neurologist has access to your imaging laboratory and watches the physical exam done by the emergency room physician and makes a determination whether this is an appropriate um, uh, patient for TPA. Another area, and this is an area that we um, have done a lot of work in, is in pediatric emergency care. We have about 35 uh, sites now uh, where we're in those small emergency rooms because a lot of emergency rooms are staffed by um, moonlighting internists um, that are that uh, our fellows go out and uh, go out and moonlight in emergency rooms and often um, small emergency rooms in general don't see that many critically ill or injured children so even people that are trained don't see it that much. We have a pediatric critical care physician available. We've done a number of studies. This is parental satisfaction, whether the telemedicine was used or the phone was used, a little bit higher satisfaction. But this is a study that we did, we published in critical care, um, that, that the, the reviewers were blinded whether or not a consult was done, whether it was done by phone or whether it was done um, uh, by telemedicine. And, and they, the, the reviewers found that higher quality care um, was delivered when telemedicine was used. And this may be one of the reasons. This is a paper we published in pediatrics um, <laughs> that showed that medication errors were much lower if a pediatric critical care physician was available and involved in the care. Because you're making really rapid decisions with 
doses that most people aren't, aren't comfortable with, so it makes a difference. Inpatient care. Um, there's a lot of inpatient care that's done. So we do consults in infectious disease. There's actually a big demand for infectious disease in places that don't have ID docs. Um, we do psych consults um, in hospitals. We do neurology consults. But the biggest use of, um, and we don't actually even do this, but a lot of people do, um, there are about 15% of beds in the United States right now are covered by uh, tele-ICU. And what that means is that when the team in the hospital leaves to go to their office or go home at night, a team picks up that patient, they're, they're watching the patient, they're monitoring their vitals, they can write orders, they can do all those kinds of things. And so there have been a number of studies, and I just picked one that was a, a good study. Some studies haven't shown as much benefit, but in general, most of the studies have shown that there's lower mortality and reduced stays when there's somebody caring for the patient 24-7. Now there's some problems, which I'll talk about in a second. This is the frontier that I get asked about when I give talks oh, because okay. people uh, particularly know that if you can operate from 10 feet away or 20 feet away outside the operating room <laughs> with a Da Vinci robotic system, which people are doing all kinds of surgeries with this, why can't you operate 100 miles away? Well, certainly you can mentor 100 miles away because these the, the Da Vinci system now allows for a second person to view and actually you can, can have some controllers so you can do the driver training model if you need to, like take over the case. But so telementoring probably isn't very controversial. But telesurgery is something that's actually been around for longer than you think. Um, this is the Lindbergh operation, named because it went from New York to France. Um, it, was, it was done to Strasbourg, France. A cholecystectomy was done on a 68-year-old patient. Um, this patient recovered nicely. They, the story goes, they prepared for their press conference on September 11th um, oh boy. to uh, publicize this case. And obviously, there were other things happening in New York. but. Um, this is a case that was done back then and was done successfully. So this hasn't been done widely, but this is a report soon after that, um, a Canadian experience, where they were doing surgeries about 100 miles away, I think. Um, I have to look at a map to see North Bay to Hamilton. But they did uh, 21 cases. They had a rescue team standing by the patient, but they had no interoperative complications. They didn't have to open any. and patients and the, the patients um, had lights of stay equivalent. So what are the challenges? So licensure, obviously you need to be licensed in the state if you're, if you're providing definitive treatment to a patient, whether it's prescribing medicine or something, most states require you're licensed in that state. Credentialing used to be a big problem, but credentialing has become less of a problem now. So you're a pediatric critical care doc and you want to provide care into an emergency room, CMS and the Joint Commission now say it's okay to accept the credentialing of the university for the rural hospital as long as the medical staff votes that they will accept the credentialing process of the remote of the larger hospital. So now there's proxy credentialing. One of the issues that arises, but this is often taken care of by contract, is that if you're the attending, you leave at night, and in the morning you come back and the patient has now been intubated, they have lines in, they have new meds on and all this stuff, said, who did this to my patient? Um, this is a, you know, what I wanted for this patient. Um, there may be disputes between that. That's often, there. now most of those teams do levels of care. What level of care will you allow me to do? I think there's um, some issues there are a lot of for-profit companies that are doing tele-ICU and doing telestroke now. Um, there is a North Carolina study that was published a few years ago that showed that the rural hospitals with the highest bottom line were the ones who actually got these companies interested rather than the most remote needy rural hospitals. So there is the profit um, issue that comes up in this with robotics mainly technical issues, I think, are some of the challenges that we, we uh, face. So what are the, some of the ethical issues? So 
in just-in-time consultation, as we say, like emergency medicine. You expect when you're going into an emergency room that you're going to see the emergency room physician, but you don't expect to be on a screen with a camera on you with a bunch of fellows and residents and an attending from the <laughs> university watching them cut your clothes off or doing those kinds of things. So how do you address that when it's truly an emergency? And again, it's probably, if it's critical, it's probably not that much of an issue, but it is something for us to think about. Um, what about if it's not used? What if you have a critically ill child, you provide care, you make a medication error, and there's a complication, and telemedicine was sitting in the closet, and you didn't use it? Um, what about the weighing the risk of the provider versus weighing the risk of, of the patient? We have used this um, for this reason. So we have had our, our in, in infectious disease docs not have to suit up with double suits and double gloves and all that stuff every time they want to go see a very sick, contagious patient. From just outside the room, they sit and talk to the patient with a screen right beside him and have the nurse do some exam and that kind of stuff. But again, you can see taking that to the extreme where you weigh on the side of let's protect the, the, the doctor versus protect the uh, patient. Telestroke and pediatric emergencies um, do allow for immediate intervention, very appropriate intervention. But if the goal of it is to keep the patient in the remote hospital rather than, as we say in telestroke, drip and ship, um, can you provide the care? Is it better to have a stroke patient move to a stroke center once they get the TPA? But there's a financial incentive for the, for the remote hospital to say, you know, patient's doing fine, they're getting the meds they need, we'll try and keep the patient, and so we need to think about that. All right, moving along, chronic disease management. Um, this is an issue because of the um, aging population that we have in this country. You can, this is CDC stuff, but there's other, other things that you can say. Basically, older people have a lot of chronic diseases, and it costs us a lot of money. People are living longer with chronic diseases. And at the same time, as people get older and they may need more, more care, they still say they want to live and stay in their homes indefinitely. So what if we tried to replicate the nursing home at home? What if we tried to keep somebody at home? What do we need? We need educated patient, educated family caregivers. We need physiologic monitoring. We need to be able to video and visit the patient. We need to make sure they're taking their medicines. We need to figure out how to get them to do rehabilitation. And I'll talk about gamification of rehabilitation. Are they, their activities of daily living, are they, are they getting stuff out of the refrigerator? Are they going into the bathroom, et cetera? And also, we also need to be able to analyze the data that flow from these kinds of things. Well, the big success story, the gigantic success story is with the VA. The VA has hundreds of thousands of per patients being moni monitored and managed at home with um, individual care plans. And this is their data from 10 years ago when they first started. There's 17,000 patients they put on this. They reduced uh, bed days by 25% in the population, hospital admissions, relatively high satisfaction score with relatively low costs. There are many studies done on, on telemonitoring, of monitoring a patients uh, at home. This paper just came out, um, August 2018. Um, somebody looked at the 42 randomized controlled trials of, of uh, telemedicine in diabetes, and it was, it's very clear that hemoglobin A1C is reduced when people are, are using telemedicine versus managing the care on their own. There's other, heart failure, there's been some mixed results in the literature, but in general, heart failure has shown um, to be benefited by um, monitoring, and basically you monitor activity level, heart rate, weight, a, a number of things, and you can predict when somebody is, is going downhill. And that's important because readmission rates are very high for heart failure. And then this is a study in the Lancet about uh, hypertension. What do these things look like? And this is just one I picked out. Um, the, you know, little Band-Aid strips that measure all those things, that sends it to your iPhone, or your, 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 your cell phone, um, you can see that yourself, and this can become a gateway 
to your care team. Um, NASA has been um, really active in this area. They call this a tattoo. It's not really a tattoo. It's actually a little sticky thing, but they want to monitor the people on the space station all the time. They want to monitor astronauts all the time, so they're really advancing these kinds of monitors that people can wear, and it's measuring all those kinds of things. We know we can continuously monitor glucose in people. This doesn't sound like a big deal. This is a big, this was a big deal. This is our PCORI grant, our diabetes grant. And this was, we used Apple Health Kit and the iPhone with these patients to integrate their data into Epic, which is the electronic health record. And basically it goes into the MyChart, the patient portal, and patients can see their activity level and other things that they put into it but also the clinician at their visits can see that. And so it becomes part. So having a gateway to the electronic health record for these monitors is really very, is key. Medication adherence, I'll quickly go through this. Basically, old people take a lot of medicines and they mess up a lot and it's expensive. Um, so medication adherence, there's med minder systems that you can, when you open the cap, it tells you, you know, it, it records you open the cap. But this is Proteus, and this is, um, Proteus is a chip that goes in the pill. And this is a digestible chip that's completely harmless, but when it hits your stomach acid, it says what pill you took and when you took it. And there's a lot of uses for this. With transplant patients, people are using it more and more for psych patients. Abilify has talked about putting this in every pill um, because it's very cheap. The, the, the point is, you know, if you have somebody that needs to be on psych medications, a kid goes off to college, the parents don't need to call them every night, did you take your pills? They can see it. But you talk about invasion of privacy. This is um, an invasion of privacy. Gamification of rehabilitation. This is a, a, a study that we did um, that looked at um, using the Xbox and reprogramming the Xbox to, to create a game that does exactly the kind of rehabilitation, like if you're rotator cuff exercise, it can measure whether you roll the, the bowling ball right or hit the tennis ball. It can measure exactly whether you're doing the thing right. It can tell you, it can tell your physical therapist, and the physical therapist can concentrate on the people that don't do it right. This is a summary slide from a, a paper that Heather Young, our Dean of the School of Nursing, and I uh, just published in the uh, Journal of General Internal Medicine, looking at how these things all come together. There's body sensors that measure sleep and mood and your heart rate. There's home sensors that, you know, measure activities of daily living and other things. There's, there's community and social things. Are you connecting with other people in your community with your disease? We know that social isolation is a big risk factor for people um, who are older. Um, so that kind of thing. And then all of that flows to the care team and generates a lot of data. That data needs to be um, analyzed and, and there needs to be some predictive analytics associated with it so you can predict who you need to see and those kinds of things. Now, it's not to say you can't cheat. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of people, we, we prescribe steps to our diabetics and they can certainly cheat on that, but it's, most people don't. Um, so what about challenges and opportunities here? So integration of all this with the care team and the primary care physician. This is not a model of care that I'm a primary care physician that I'm used to. I'm used to episodic care, see the patient, I look what, what happened at the time in the 20 minutes they're in the, in the room, that's your blood pressure, that's your heart rate, I don't care what happened at other times, but how do you co continuously care for a patient? How do you get the data converted into actionable information for a busy clinician? That PCORI grant thing I showed you is one of the ways you turn it into graphs and things. Patients need to know whether somebody is really watching this all the time or are you just watch, looking at it when they come into the office because what if their heart rate drops to 40 and the patient's assuming that somebody's watching it or they would have called me if that was a problem. Who maintains the equipment? And who determines the quality of the apps? There's thousands of apps out there for health, particularly for diabetes. A lot of organizations are making a decision to create an app formulary just like a medication formulary. 
where they're pre-tested, they know there's empiric evidence of the value of that, and so when you see a patient, you say, you're, you're a new diabetic, you can use one of these three apps, and they'll lo we'll, we'll load that right now onto your iPhone. So, uh, privacy. In, in monitoring people in their home, this is, a, this is a big deal. Particularly when you're doing things like, did they go into the bathroom? Did they get up? Are they walking around the house? Or are they watching TV? Did they take the pill at 8 o'clock or not? The Proteus system tells us. They said they did, but we know they lied. Um, so that's, that's one thing. But patients are willing to give up some privacy rather than going to a nursing home. What about confidentiality with, with, with the monitoring? If a family is part of the care team, is it appropriate to give them access to it and, and what's the process for doing that with someone with dementia and those kinds of things? Um, should the family caregivers have access to the EHR so they can record into the EHR about what's going on and how do we educate them, et cetera? And then physician responsibility for data from non-prescribed wearables. So some patients come in and say, yeah, I've been doing 10,000 steps, it says so on my Garmin um, uh, watch. Um, but again, how do, how do we know? And I can tell you, if you want the most steps, get a Fitbit. If you want, the, they're, 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 <laughs> your, your iPhone does less. I mean, we put all three and four on people and measured them all, and they don't all come out the same way. So just be aware of that. Finally, I'm going to touch real briefly on direct-to-consumer care. Um, I'm going to try not, and, and, and I honestly am not trying to be negative about this at all, but I, I do when I talk about this sometimes come off as a little, a little bit negative about this. So this is a different kind of care. This is a no, no, your doctor, your care team is not saying, I want you to have this telemedicine call. This is somebody who's directly connecting with one of these places and possibly paying. These are the kinds of things back in 2012, 2013 that people contacted these places for. Respiratory illness, urinary tract um, problems, et cetera. This is a study that Rand did um, that looked at patients who complained of a urinary tract infection. Now this is an old study and things have gotten better, but the people who went online and saw a physician, 8% of them got a urine culture versus 51% that went to an office, 99% of the people got an antibiotic, um, whereas only 44% when they went to their doctor. It was cheaper. Um, so again, this is you know, one of the challenges. Now this is more recent. Um, this is a, a paper that was recently published that looked at studies. One thing that is good, the follow-up rates, whether you go to an urgent care or you go to online, are about the same. People go see the follow-up. Use of antibiotics for colds, for URIs, not that different. A lot of doctors, to get somebody out of the office, gives them antibiotics. But they broad spectrum is you, you know, big broad spectrum antibiotics are used more frequently with direct to consumer versus office care. And then there was a group that did a secret shopper thing. These were actually fellows that gave classic symptoms of diseases to see how often they were diagnosed properly. 24% of the time they were misdiagnosed and treatment guidelines were only used 54% of the time. I think it was actually in dermatology. And we know that from studies that direct-to-consumer physicians are much less likely to order tests. So what are some of the questions about this? So we don't really have a good evidence base um, for this. Um, and so that's a challenge. What are the limits of this? What kinds of conditions should you see and what shouldn't you see? What metrics should be used to determine whether people are delivering the highest quality? A lot of these are for-profit proprietary um, companies and so they don't want to share their data necessarily. What are the technical issues and what are the issues about getting that information from that visit into your electronic health record or your medical record? So, how important is the doctor-patient relationship? You know, there is something about even when you go see a physician um, in an urgent care, you sit down, you talk to them, they got a kind of a sense of who you are, et cetera. Um, and other kinds of telemedicine, your primary care physician is the one who's sort of coordinating the care, so you have a physician relationship. 
But direct-to-consumer care, if you say, okay, I'm going to pay 100 bucks because I want an antibiotic for my urinary tract infection, and they say, you know, I don't really think you need an antibiotic, they're going to say, look, I just paid you 100 bucks out of pocket. So those are kind of issues. The one thing that I've talked about is you are now using the person's computer with their webcam as a medical device. What if I have, after this talk, we go out and have a big Mexican meal, and I call the guy and say, my stomach hurts after eating this big meal. And say, oh, you're probably having a reflux. Let me give you a H2 blocker, or a proton pump inhibitor, or something like that. But he can't tell I'm jaundiced because my lighting, I don't have full spectrum lighting, or it's those kinds of things. So you worry about those kinds of things. The use of standard of care guidelines. What, what are the standard of care guidelines for this? And if, you know, um, access to the medical record, both for learning about what their allergies and other stuff are, and, and the other side, getting it into the record. And, and finally, the, if you're a CMO or a, or a chief quality officer for one of these organizations, and you know, <laughs> and we know from the literature, patients are more satisfied if they get a prescription, particularly a pain medication. So if you're looking at this and saying, boy, the satisfaction's really high, but we're giving out too many of these drugs, is that an issue? So in summary, I'm going to do two summary slides and I'm done. Um, Evidence-based guidelines are always a good thing. And I really do mean evidence-based. Empiric studies of, and I know I sound like a telemedicine enthusiast generally, it needs to be done by people who aren't just telemedicine enthusiasts. Um, you know, obviously there's licensure and credentialing issues, and we talked about those. I do feel like even in states where that isn't necessarily required, I do feel telemedicine is still new enough that informed consent is always helpful. And I also think that it's really important to have data security and a HIPAA compliant process. We have great doctors, great consultants who say, I'm on maternity leave. Is there a way I can do some telemedicine I'm a dermatologist from my home. That's great, and we've done that. We've set it up with you know, secure lines and encrypted stuff and those kinds of things, but you also need to make sure the room you're doing it in <coughs> is protected from people hearing what's going on and all those kinds of things. We tell our consultants, do not compromise. If you're not sure, if you can't do as good of a job over this, you should tell the patient they need to come in. And you need to regularly assess patient satisfaction, have a process for complaints. And again, this is the professional appearance, attitude, etiquette, eating a breakfast burrito in your Star Wars pajamas, talking to a person just because you're comfortable at home isn't a, a professional appearance. Um, and so th that needs to be uh, taken into account. So in summary, this is going to continue to increase. There's no question. Um, they're going to be continued to be used. Um, it has the potential, these, these technology-enabled models of care have the potential to improve access, reduce costs, and improve quality. I think they, they certainly have great promise, but they have their limitations, um, and there are you know, obviously ethical implications of some of these models of care that need to be studied, so I think groups need to think about this, you know, both professional societies and others a need to look at this. I will, I'm not going through these slides, but I just want to show you that the AMA has published a whole bunch of, of, gui of, um, mm. of <laughs> guidelines in, uh, in ethical practice in telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll quit. Thank you very much for that presentation. And, and obviously, telemedicine holds, you know, a lot of promise, and uh, um, also opens up access for a lot of people. But I was wondering if the flip side is also true that through telemedicine, maybe depending on where someone is located, um, maybe in a not desirable neighborhood, um, things like that, would it suddenly become, or is there a potentiality for it to become a way of practicing medicine without necessarily? being there in person. Yeah. 
So like a justice issue, the ethics maybe yeah. surrounding that kind of situation. So there are, um, that's certainly been an issue that we, we've talked about. So I started a program uh, with some other people called Rural Prime, which is a, a program for, a track for medical students that, that are tracked towards rural practice. Some of those people, and they enter their first year, and some of those people go into neurology and they feel guilty because they, I mean, one of our people is a, is a cardiovascular surgeon now. But he comes back to me all the time and says, I want to do some consults to rural areas. So, I, you know, because they don't want to. But, you know, I think there's also the issue of making specialty care available. That kid with the, one of the reasons that the California Healthcare Foundation paid for that direct derm to get started, which is a thriving company now, is basically for the for the Medicaid, pop, the Medi-Cal population, um, to have access to dermatologists. It's very hard to find a dermatologist for anybody, unless you want Botox. And then I understand you can get in quickly. But, um, but, so I think there is the advantage where you can provide services to underserved areas via telemedicine, that for whatever reason you may not have been able to do for a variety of reasons. We actually, for a while, and, and I'm not sure where it is, but whether or not, if you do 20%, if you're an endocrinologist, and you do 20% of your endocrinology practice to underserved areas, can you get um, loan reimbursement from the National Health Service Corps for providing that for 20% of your time? Can you get 20% of your loan payback when I'm not going to move to Two Dot Montana or some th town to to do th this because I wouldn't have enough patients, but is that is that a possibility? So I think it really is a real a real issue um, that that can people who have the desire to provide care to underserved populations can do this through telemedicine and can make a difference. You 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 choose. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, what about um, facilitating competition from other countries, um, how things are reduce um, Medicare uh, medical costs? For example, there's been talk about importing uh, pharmaceuticals from Canada right. to reduce costs. What about importing medical care, say, from Canada? Um, so, but then, of course, there are questions of as how does the FDA regulate yeah. that? Yeah. Well, it's the, the licensure issue. So, state medical boards are very powerful, and basically. State medical boards consider themselves consumer protection agencies. So they say, I don't care what doctors want. If you're living in the state, if you're, if you're sitting in our state and you get medical care, it's our job to make sure that care was good. And the only way we know to make sure that care is good or one way we know is to make sure you're licensed in our state. And it's very hard for people from other countries often to get licensed in, in uh, some states. but. Where this has been used, I chose not to do teleradiology because almost all radiology is done this way. But people have these Nighthawk services where they have somebody from India or somebody from Australia or somebody reading those things. But I do think that this is something that will open up. I do think there's some docs that have trained in the U.S., are licensed in the U.S., go back to India, go back to you know somewhere else that can provide consultations in the U.S. Currently. There's a lot of consultations out to developing countries, but, and we get, I mean, Todd, who works with me um, and runs our international programs, we have way more desire from China for our specialists than we can provide. But what about the reverse of that? Because they're, you know, it, it could reduce medical costs and address some of the, some of the healthcare professional shortage areas. What's interesting there, by the way, is that it may be the case that despite a state medical association, a patient may say, well, if I go to my local doctor, I don't have health insurance, it's going to cost me $400. Yeah. If I just dial up the sky in country X, it's only going to be $30. So, And they're not likely to get caught. Right, right. And I bet it's going on. Right. I'll bet you it's going on and they're, um, you know, they're, somebody's doing it. The issue is providing a prescription. Right. That's where the, the challenge is. But certainly people get consults and they um, can be directed, you know, probably more efficiently to what they need. 
or Joe. Um, first of all, thank you for coming, Dr. Nose, but um, just speak loud so we get picked sure, up. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the rural prime program at UC Davis, and I know a lot of med schools these days are using um, primary care as their metric for success. Um, I was wondering, do you see telemedicine as kind of a temporary measure until we have more doctors in rural areas, or is this, do you think, uh, going to be a, a curve that grows exponentially? Because I know that there is a lot of emphasis, even among the UCs and a lot of other schools, towards injecting, like, as many primary care doctors in these rural areas as possible. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, I think as we have adequate numbers of uh, primary care providers in these remote areas, I think telemedicine may be used more, more frequently for specialty consults. But I do think that there is, um, there's increasing number of of uh, primary care telemedicine being done, which may be closer to your question, um, where a family physician may be in one town, but there's three smaller towns around them, and they have a PA or a nurse practitioner in those communities, and they coordinate the care that way, because in our state, you know, different states have different rules about nurse practitioners, but they, they actually extend their, their expertise and work as a, a virtual group, if you will, in smaller communities. But you're, you're right, there is a real emphasis on getting more primary care providers out there, but we're a long ways. We, we are in California, we're one of the states with the highest number of, of physicians over 60 years of age, and that's particularly true in some of the most underserved areas. So we're gonna, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Because for whatever reason, the legislature doesn't expand our medical schools very fast. Those of you who tried to get in, I know you probably are aware of that. Samir, so we have a, a question from online. Yes, we have a, we have a couple of questions. The first one is, um, how do you feel telemedicine will change medical school education in the coming years? So it's interesting. There was a, there's something called the graduate questionnaire that they ask all fourth year medical students when they graduate to, to find out how their experience was in their medical school. And they piloted a question in, on that questionnaire were you trained in telemedicine during your medical school? Which is the first time I've seen that, which means somebody's thinking about that. I do think that it will be important. Um, I have an uh, email right now from somebody in, in uh, Denmark who was, I was just at a conference with them recently, and they, they, uh, they're trying to incorporate telemedicine into their medical school curriculum. And they want to know how, how to do it and where it should be in the medical school curriculum and what, you know, how we should do that. And I think that um, it will be incorporated in. Typically, the way we do it is when you're on the, your neurology rotation, you're sitting with the stroke neurologist when they're doing their teleconsult. But some of our people in our psychiatry department, in our psychiatry residency program, you can choose some different tracks, and one of those tracks for electives is telemedicine. Um, so they can, they can do, because we have a pretty, um, there's some of our psychiatrists that are very active in telemedicine. And so I think it will happen in different ways, but I do think it will change because it is a different kind of practice. And the flip side of that is primary care physicians need to be much better at their physical exam and diagnostic skills. They need to know the neurologic exam backwards and forwards, know all the terms for when they're quickly examining a patient in an emergency room with a neurologist asking, you know, check this, check this, check this, and they need to know. So I think on both sides, physical exam skills are gonna become more important for those surrogate examiners, and the ability to provide care through a surrogate is a skill that a lot of specialists need to learn. A lot of universities do this well because we do it through our residents and our fellows. We, you know, we get information and we say, okay, do this and try this. But again, I think that will change education. Yes. Thanks for your talk. I'm a pediatrician in Berkeley and we use uh, our families sending us photos and videos yeah. all the time for care. Um, in fact, last night, late last night, someone sent a video of a young baby who has infantile spasms who's now hospitalized. Um, my two questions for you, 
One is, are there uh, guidelines for setting up family expectations? So this was, you know, diagnosed at 10 p.m. last night. Um, how many of us are going to be always working at 10 p.m.? Yeah. Um, and the second question is it regards reimbursement, um, of which at the moment there appears to be none, or occasionally we can get we can yeah. bill for it. So um, there are, you know, there, there really aren't uh, guidelines around people sort of generating it themselves off their iPhone or they're, you know, taking a video and sending it. Um, although I think, you know, there, there are attempts to do that, but it's, you know, again, that's involving the patient as part of the care team, but I, I think that's a valuable thing to do. And I've heard of a number of cases, just like what you said, where somebody my baby's not acting right, and somebody said, get him in here you know, immediately, or this is this. The reimbursement is based on um, a number of rules uh, depending on the payer. Some payers do pay for it, um, uh, but a lot of the rules are based on what they call originating site. So the originating site, the home isn't considered a, a legitimate originating site for a lot of payers. So if, if, the, if the patient is in their home when the consult is being done, um, it doesn't count. But that's, that's changing, and Medi-Cal Medi is changing. Um, there's some laws that were just passed where the home is being considered. They're trying to figure out how to implement it, but Medi-Cal will, will begin to recognize the home as an originating site. Right now, it's for chronic disease management, but again, those rules are changing, and that's that's one of the things that need to happen. But there are some third party payers that will do that. But again, some of them look at it as, right now you're doing it free, why would we expand it? You know, just like now we're gonna start having to pay for every time somebody calls you at home. And you know, so that's been the barrier. You mentioned the AMA guidelines, by the way. Do you think they uh, are good, don't go far enough, go too far? I, I, the AMA guidelines are, are good. They're sort of all over the board and some I, I'd, I'd like you to look at them and see how many of these things you think are pure, you know, sort of bioethics questions versus procedural. You know, like they say, you should you should be professional. Yeah. I, you know, when you're doing a telemedicine consult, right. that's sort of that has nothing to do with telemedicine. Whenever you interact with a patient, you should be professional. Mm -hmm. So, they ha they include those things in it. But you know. Yeah, we'll go to the back. Yes, oh, speak you. up if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, and, and great talk. In a similar vein, I'm curious about cybersecurity and, you know, can cybersecurity keep up with the demand of telemedicine and how that can be handled and, and just the, the guidelines that are present to keep this information safe and secure? Yeah. Uh, you're crossing multiple jurisdictions. Just kind of trick your accounts on that, too. Yeah, so when we're... Um, so one of the things we started was something called the California Telehealth Network that was $22 million came from the FCC and we got another eight from other places. But we set up a, a secure HIPAA compliant network that goes to rural hospitals and, and federally qualified health centers and rural clinics and things like that. That is a secure system that, that, that sort of is, it's now its own 501c3 organization. Um, and by the way, it has um, MPLS, which it means you can prioritize traffic. So an emergency will get the diamond lane with lights and sirens, and the x-ray will be coming in the slow lane. Um, the, I think that's the most, but most, increasingly, most people are doing this over the open internet. They're relying on encryption. So it's encrypted, so there's, you know, a codec, it, it's, it's coded on one end, it's decoded on the other end, but again, it, 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 I'm sure it's not secure, but the theory has always been, and I've heard it at many telemedicine conferences when this question is asked, people are more anxious to get into your banking than they are watching your skin lesion get examined. But when you start, you can't guess when you're getting into things like robotic surgery over distance. <coughs> Somebody hacks that in the middle of it. You better have really good procedures to shut it down and the rescue team to take over and all those kinds of things. So I think it is an issue and the sophistication of the hackers is exponentially increasing. I mean, we can't obviously keep up and 
uh, you know, I think I think it is a real issue, and I think we need to think about, you know, think about it. And uh, I'm not sure um, beyond trying to set up secure private highways for this um, and encrypting. The encryption uh, methodologies are getting better and better all the time, but it is an issue that people are beginning to worry about more and more. Amy? It sounds like you built such an interesting and well thought out and organized system at UC Davis. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I had no idea. It's hard to live here in the Bay Area and, um, and not be aware of, all, as a physician, not be aware of all of these um, digital, privately VC funded startups that are telemedicine health apps. Um, that pay physicians to do consults with patients they've never seen before on a question about a URI or UTI or something yeah. and, and prescribe an antibiotic and you'll get some sort of reimbursement. And it's a social platform and it gamifies things. Um, there's very little vetting of those physicians. Whose ethical responsibility is it to let consumers know who are paying $99 a month or whatever the membership is that you know, it could be John Smith, who never doesn't know anything about medicine, looking up Dr. Dr. Google and giving you advice about right. what to do about what you're complaining about. So these companies, if you look at them, they say how they choose their physician. You know, all you know, I, you know, I always look at those things. Are all of your physicians board certified? Currently board certified? Have they recertified? You know, um, are you know are they you know Obviously, they have to be licensed in the state where they're practicing. What are their qualifications? You know, I, you know, again, I, I'm not trying to be critical of these places, but I've often wondered about trying to put those docs up against the um, medical board's database of physicians who've been in trouble. Is there is there how much overlap of those two groups are there? Because they 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 then had to take over, you know, doing that because they got kicked out of their medical group. I don't know that that's true, and, and I hope it's not. There's some of these companies have hired docs that, for whatever reasons, there's some ver have met some very great docs that are disabled, that that want to do this kind of work. Um, but there's there's a bunch of companies out there, and a lot of venture capital went into these things, and so far, and I don't know, Todd, you may know, but I don't know that any of those are really turning much of a profit, and. You know, again, we won't get into the whole philosophy of, of for-profit healthcare and those kinds of things. But but the reality is that the more you have, you know, stockholders that are getting have, having get paid off this visit as well as fund the physician and you know all the fund the equipment, it, you know, you start to wonder where does what what shortcuts are you taking? Um, you know, as an experiment a number of years ago, I actually signed on as a physician to a number of these apps. And, it, and within a minute of like entering your name and your address and the license number, you're, you're on. And it's, you're not on for your specialty, but you're on. You can answer any question across the board that you may have absolutely no expertise in. Um, so, um, and consumers are blinded to that. All they know is that, especially in areas like this, that you feel this or that, fine. You can call from your bed and get a get a doctor to give you a thing, and I'm happy to pay that ninety nine dollars for that convenience. Yeah. Whose responsibility is it to? I mean, how can we, who who should be? Well, I think that um, I think you know, that you know I vetting and and more. Yeah, I think the medical board. Although there's a famous case in Texas with against Teladoc, where the the medical board tried to restrict their practice, um, and. Um, you know, it's it, so it is an ongoing issue. But the, you know, supposedly, again, as the medical board is supposed to be protecting consumers, um, they they should have a role in this. But it's it, you know, as people said, it, this guy from Denmark said, it kind of seems like it's the wild west out there. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's y you can't even keep track of what's going on, and it, it's to some degree and true. And there's a lot of money in it. There's a lot of money. Another question from online. Yeah, so we have another question. Um, telemedicine allows us to see patients more frequently, but how do we make it so that doctors are not on call 24-7? Well, I do think that um, there are, um, our, our pediatric group that has a call schedule for telemedicine. Mm -hmm. So they say, your doctor isn't here tonight, but I'm, on, I'm the person you know, on. 
um, they, because they actually have full-blown fancy telemedicine units in their home because they connect to emergency departments um, at, you know, lots of rural places. Um, but I think you, you have to set that up. There, you know, a lot of people start innocently saying, well, it's, I know this patient. And once you start texting with patients, once you attach an image to that text, you're doing telemedicine. And so it can be overwhelming and it depends on what kind of barriers because to some degree you want you, you want to have clear it, it to be clear when you are on and you're responsible for patients and when you're not so you can deliver the best care when you are on so i think call groups um, for that and it's going to change you know whereas they who's on call tonight and they transfer the phone call it may be that we set up some sort of um, gateway for these kinds of texts and stuff where there's a single number and they, they route it through there and that technically is possible. So they say the doctor that will be answering your text is Dr. X and he'll answer in, or she'll answer in 10 minutes. We have time for one or two more questions. So uh, why don't we do, uh, okay, we'll go ahead, yes. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask about, the fact that you had on the PowerPoint that direct-to-consumer physicians order less tests consistently. I was wondering, do you know the reason why that is? Or well, be, because of the fact that if, if you go into an urgent care, so let's, let's take the, the, the online physician side of, of this for a minute. If you go into an urgent care, they're going to make money if they do a lot of tests. So they're, you know, urgent care is going to order more tests to get a diagnosis. On the other side of it, it's very hard. If somebody says, "Well, the reason I called you is I didn't want to go down and give it, get a get, give a urine to somebody and have to get out in the snow, you know, to do that." So, it's it's much harder for an online physician to order a test. Where would they even order it? You know, they have to they have to call a medical group, you know, that or go to the emergency room and drop off a urine and those kinds of things. Some of those physicians have an association with a group, so. Some organizations, I was shocked when I got a card in the mail as part of, you know, Blue Cross preferred provider um, coverage, you now have access to Teladoc, so please feel free to call them. So the University of California is paying for it. A lot of our doctors went nuts and they called me and said, did you do this? I said, no, I didn't. I was as surprised as you. But um, if they're associated with a group, then they can say, go in and get it. But a lot of these are just people, some that are uninsured or have real high deductibles. So basically they say, I'm gonna pay $75 and just see this person rather go to an emergency room and run my deductible up. Margaret? Yeah, what issues have you come across in terms of Epic not playing well with others and siloing of the EHRs and being able to access those so that these teledocs can give appropriate scripts and not endanger patients with allergies or other yeah so um, there's a whole long discussion about epic <laughs> <laughs> I mean we we have epic we love epic but they definitely run the world and they know it um, so um, you know they're 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 very good but um, the some of the issues um, are is you know, we have Care Everywhere um, that docs can access it if, if we know that, you know, if, if, if we know that they want to access it and their, you know, permission is given. But it is hard, it, it is hard. You know, somebody calls up and says, yeah, I'm a, I'm a patient at Kaiser. Um, how does somebody get into the Kaiser system? And that's very hard to do. And, and clearly some guidelines probably ought to be developed around that that is safe and secure because that, you know, they're, they're protecting, Kaiser's protecting their patients very well. They do a great job. Um, so those are, those are things that I think, you know, we need to do more work on so that there is an interchange of that information. You have a question, or there was a question? Um, yeah, yeah I, I just had a quick question. I, because we were talking about security and I was thinking about um, like user side devices and how you can kind of secure that. And I know you mentioned the new Apple HealthKit APIs. Yeah. I think you mentioned. Um, how have those been? Or like, do you think that could help with these security issues using personal devices for telemedicine? Yes. 
Um, and and th there's a lot of work being done on those kinds of things. I mean, the, um, there are a lot of tools that they're building in for this kind of thing, and so I think it's I think it's um, it's going to be extremely helpful. Um, and again, I don't believe Apple is quite getting into the telemedicine thing, but they're providing all the tools for that um, and and making that making that easier. And they're, you know, they make great products with good pictures. You can take a really clear picture of your skin lesion and send it to somebody. But yeah, there are there are apps and tools to do that with. Any interest in Facebook? I mean, they're sort of moving in, or, or, or Amazon? I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> There's some talk that Amazon is going to get into this yeah, business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have time for one more question. But yes. I was wondering if there's any interest in engaging multilingual physicians in this way. I know that in South Africa, for example, where there's 11 official languages, um, and most physicians who are actually able to practice in rural underserved areas because they may have uh, more we uh, wealth having um, the low income that they actually receive are English and Afrikaans speaking, but they're treating 98% Zulu speaking population. So there's interest in maybe uh, using telemedicine to have uh, Zulu and Kosa speaking physicians consulting on those patients. Do you know of any interest like that in the United States for treating immigrant communities? So one of the things that, that um, we have used, um, so one thing, because telemedicine you can reach a much broader audience, um, you know, a much broader population and geography, you can find, the, you know, a physician who speaks a, a you know, less common language to provide a consultation. But we also have a three-way um, option that we can basically bring an interpreter in. Um, we have interpreters that we have interpreters that speak many, many, many languages in our place, and we, we route them into the process. So they're up in a little picture in picture, and they're interpreting. So that, that is helpful. But it is, you're, you're right, that's one of the values of that is, is finding a physician who speaks that language um, and somebody who's bicultural as well. Because we found that the, you know, bicultural, bilingual docs, uh, particularly in things like psychiatry and other things, do a much, much better job over telemedicine um, than just using an interpreter. Because um, it, is, it is a little distant and cold. Well, clearly this is a fascinating uh, area that uh, you've enlightened us about and that's going to change all of our lives and those of many other people. And please join, so thank you, and please join me in thanking Dr. Nathan for his talk. Thanks, fabulous. I just can't imagine 10 years from now what this is going to be. <laughs> we have a reception, so please uh, feel free to join us and have something to eat and drink, and thank you all for coming. And People online, thank you for joining us. That was great. I'm going to look at the AMA guidelines. Yeah. Uh, See what you think. Yeah. You'll have them at the end of my talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th those are, so those are eight, actually, sort of, go, go online and see them the way, because yeah, yeah. I kind of tried to call.